and I've just recently passed the NCLEX and I am now a registered professional nurse in the state of New York and I am here to tell you how Top Rank has helped me achieve my dreams. Now, I just want to say that I am so thankful to Top Rank of your academy for being such a huge part of my success. And that is because the top rank lecturers were able to deliver the nursing concepts and elaborate their materials in such a comprehensive manner. Their teaching style helped me recall my nursing knowledge and, you know, as a student nurse trained in the Philippines, um, top rank was able to elaborate how nursing skills are delivered in the United States. They also taught me test taking strategies, which helped me so much during the exam. And not to mention, the staff is very accommodating, and I assure you that they will answer all of your concerns and questions with patience. And as a very anxious person, I never felt intimidated asking my questions. And that also helped, especially that the review was held online. Not only did Top Rank Review prepare me, um, refresh my nursing knowledge, they also reminded me of the importance of doing my part as a student, which is to practice more questions and read more information. They also motivated me, and most especially, they prayed with me, and always reminded me to believe in myself. And those are just a few of the ways Top Rank will train you for. Having said all of that, I can highly recommend that you prepare for your international exams with top rank. Um, believe in yourself, practice questions, um, and learn how to ease your anxiety, and most importantly, don't forget to pray because God will bring you through it. Um, always remember what it says in Mark 11, verse 24, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Ako si top ranker Hannah Banwa, NCLEX passer in New York, USA, na review the Top Rank Review Academy. Magandang araw po sa lahat. Ako po ay magbabahagi po ng aking munting karanasan sa Top Rank Review Academy. Well, 7 years na po ako na nurse na nagtatrabaho po dito sa Bacolod City. Nung ako po ay mag-umpisang mag-aral ng NCLEX, nahirapan po ako kasi pinagsasabay ko, sabay ko po ang pag-aaral, ang aking trabaho at bilang may bahay na may dalawang anak. Uh, naging challenge din po sa akin na 10 years na po akong graduate ng nursing course. Bali, malaki po ang naitulong ng top rank sa akin upang maabot ko po ang aking tagumpay sa NCLEX dahil maliban sa abot kaya nilang review fee na uh, naididetalya rin nila ang mga topics na kung saan ako mahina. Naging madali sa akin na matandaan ang mga konsepto dahil sa mga abbreviations sa mga subjects na nai-lecture noong comprehensive exam. Nagustuhan ko rin po yung mga interactions noong final coaching para malaman kung saan pa ang aking uh, dapat pong i-improve. Na-appreciate ko din ang klarong uh, pagtalakay po ng mga professors ng mga nursing topics. Bali, ang mensahe ko lang po na may babahagi sa mga susunod na mga kukuha ng NCLEX exam na normal lang po talaga na kabahan pero dapat po magpursigi po para maabot po natin ang ating pinapangarap. Sabayan po yun ng pananampalatay sa may kapal at pursigi na mag-aral, wala po dapat tayo ikatakot. Dahil sa top rank, nandyan na lahat ang ating mga kailangan dahil sulit, napakasulit po sa top rank. Ako po si... Top ranker Marjela Briz, an NCLEX passer ng Bacolod City, Philippines, nag-review sa Top Rank International.
you are holding on to that dream. You have a choice today to go up or stay down. Now is the time to take the first step to the top. With quality review materials that produce board top notchers and thousands of board passers across professions. in dynamic, innovative, and interactive review delivery. Ensuring an excellent, balanced, relevant, and comprehensive review experience. extending support beyond review and celebrating victories together as one family. What you choose today determines your success. So make that powerful decision. Welcome to the top. Choose to be the top with top rank.
our ever-loving Father, the core of every reason, the source of truth. You who made the earth and the heavens are the ultimate goal of every knowledge seekers, the infinite wisdom, the cause of all that is good. We are truly grateful for this opportunity to gather together as a community despite the challenges we face each day. Yet you remained and gave us strength to carry on the responsibilities of bearing intelligence and using them for better purposes. We now humbly ask you to join us in our endeavor to explore the wonders of life in the world for knowledge's sake, that in whatever we learn today, we become more grounded to you, who is truth, who is love. We pray that you bless our speakers, the fount of your infinite knowledge, that they can share something worthwhile despite the limited time we have. They can channel all they know and share to us the beauty and truth of living as your child. We pray that you guide our participants, the seekers of your boundless knowledge, that they may continue to persevere in the search and be deemed worthy to share what they learn from today's session. Sanctify us, O Lord, not because we are worthy of it, but because we believe in your love and mercy, that at the end of the day, we can take home something that's amazing and meaningful. This we ask and pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Ayang magiging,
So just to introduce who Top Rank Review Academy is, we have been established in 2013. Right now, we're already considered as one of the biggest national review centers here in the country. We currently have 20 local branches and four international branches. So for our local branches, we are located in Manila for our main office. Our office is right in front of PRC in Moraita. We're located at the fifth floor of the Don Lorenzo building. Next, we have uh, our uh, Metro Manila branches in Quezon City, Marikina, Caloocan. For provincial branches, we are located in Lawag, Baguio, Dagupa, Nueva Vizcaya, Tugigaraw, Bataan, Bicol, in Legaspi, and Naga. Cebu, Iloilo, Tacloban, Calbayog, Davao, Bacolod, Zamboanga, up until Coronadal, South Cotabato. And we also have branches internationally. We have branches in Indonesia. And we are located in Jakarta and in Bandung in Indonesia. So what we basically do with there is provide them international exam review as well as trainings and seminars for their healthcare workers to be more globally competitive. And amongst all the other review centers here in the country, we're the only one who was invited at the 70th anniversary of diplomatic relations of Indonesia and the Philippines. We also have branches in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. So we provide them SPLE review as well as uh, international exam review, NCLEX, UKCBT, HAAD, Prometrics, IELTS, and OET. For our track record, we were established uh, initially as a nursing review center, but later on we have already opened a lot of uh, board exam courses such as dentistry. Our top one came from Centro Escolar University in Manila. We also offer licensure examination for teachers. Top two came from UP Manila. We also offer psychometrician review and criminology. Our top one came from Universidad de Zamboanga. And we also offer radiologic technology. This was recently announced just a few, uh, a few weeks ago. So we got the top one spot, top three, top 10, and top six. Our top one came from St. Louis University in Baguio, as well as our former top one also came from SLU Baguio for RadTech. We also offer MedTech for this year. We had a four top notchers, a uh, product of our online interactive review, as well as respiratory therapy. These four students are also products of our online interactive review for this year. We also offer midwifery, and of course, for nursing, we already got our Hall of Fame. We've got the top one spots starting 2017, 2018, and 2019. And of course, for our international exams, we are uh, consistently uh, having a 100% passing rate for all of our students. And because of this, we are now multi-awarded as the best national review center here in the country by multiple award-giving bodies, such as the Golden Globe, Best Choice, Q Asia, NAA Global Awards, and Global Excellence Awards. So Hello, good morning. Hi, can you hear me clearly? Hello. Okay, so thank you so much for uh, your responses. So before we proceed to our uh, free uh, lecture, uh, I would like first to discuss to you what are the programs that we are offering here in uh, Top Rank International. So um, here are the, the, the program that we are offering here in Top Rank International for a while. Oh, copy. Okay, so uh, we have uh, our NCLEX, of course. 
So here are the start dates of our NPLEX. So we have the comprehensive test preparation for NPLEX. So we have the day class, the regular class, which is the day class and the night class. So later on, we will be discussed uh, to you um, the schedule that uh, we have here in Top Rank International for NCLEX program. And uh, we have uh, the start date, by the way, for the NCLEX review program. So um, this coming uh, October 13, so we have the cycle 19. Um, our schedule is every, uh, every Mondays to Fridays from uh, 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. in the Philippine time for the day class. And of course, uh, for the night classes, we have the uh, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Philippine time. And we have also the final coaching program that uh, would be on uh, November 3 to November 24, cycle 12. Okay. And we have also... Hmm, we have also NCLEX review executive week and class it starts on October 23 to November 21. So uh, to those who want to enroll for the weekend class every, every Saturday to Sunday um, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Philippine time. And for the UK CBT program, our start date is on October 13. Uh, same schedule for the NCLEX. So we have the day class and the night class from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. for the Philippine time for day class and 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Philippine time for the night class. And of course, for the UKCD, UKCBT program or UKCBT review final coaching would be on November 3 to uh, 20. And for the Middle East examination like HAAD, DHA, Prometric, our start date is on October 13, 2021. So we have also the day class and the night class. And for the final coaching would be on November 3 to November 20. And we have also the IELTS program. So our start date for the IELTS program is on um, October 20 for cycle two. So our schedule for the Middle East, pro, uh, Middle East examination test preparation for IELTS is every Fridays from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. UAE time. So from Philippine, for Philippine time is 1 p.m. to 10 p.m. Philippine time. And here are the program components that we are offering here in Top Rank International. So we have the live lectures, concept-based examinations like post-tests, practice tests, critical thinking drills, comprehensive exam, bullets and predictor tests, online review, tutorial or focus group discussions, final coaching and one-on-one -on -one coaching program. And here are the um, freebies or the inclusions and previews for the comprehensive review program. So as what I like I've said a while ago, so we have the regular class, special weekend class and executive with weekend class. For the regular class, we have the day class and night class. And for the weekend class, every Friday here in Middle East from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Manila time. And for the executive weekend class, every Saturday and Sunday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Manila time. So um, these are the inclusions and freebies for the comprehensive review. So we have the 40 days high impact interactive lecture. We have also provided the 24 seven access to recorded lecture and take note good, this is good for one year access. And we have also provided the individualized study plan, individualized academic monitoring, access to 3000 NCLEX RM question and answer with rationale, NCLEX, access to NCLEX textbooks. So we provided the eBooks like the Saunders, Royal Marsdens, Saunders and Royal Marsden. And we have also provided the online learning access for 40 days academic tracking card, final coaching for 15 days, one-on-one -on -one coaching, and of course, the assessment consultation with our academic consultant. And of course, we have also um, provided the UWorld access for the NCLEX uh, review program. Okay. And for the final coaching, actually our start date for the final coaching for cycle 12 is on uh, November 3. So our schedule is every weekdays and weekend. So um, our timing is every 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Manila time. So um, these are the inclusion and freebies for final coaching program. So we have the 40 hours high impact interactive 
uh, lecture base and we also provided the 24-7 access to recorded lecture, individualized study plan, individualized academic monitoring, access to 1,000 NCLEX RN with rationale, access to NCLEX textbook, online learning access, one-on-one -on -one coaching, assessment and consultation with our academic consultant, and of course, the UWorld access. And we also have um, the NCLEX executive crash course. So nakadepende po ito sa ating students' availability. So if uh, actually, um, pinopromote po namin ito to those who have their eligibility and uh, ATP na po. Um, so these are the inclusions and previous for the executive crash course. So we have the 80 hours high impact interactive lectures, 24 seven access, individualized study plan, individualized academic monitoring, access to 3000 NCLEX RN with rationale, access to uh, NCLEX textbook like the um, Saunders learning, online learning access, and of course, one-on-one -on -one coaching and assessment and consultation. Okay, so guys, so to those who want to enroll or uh, to those who have any uh, follow-up questions regarding to our program, please don't forget to contact us and like our Facebook account, Facebook page at Top Rank Review Academy and Top Rank UAE. And please uh, don't forget to add our Facebook account, Top Rank Abu Dhabi, and follow us on our IG account, Top Rank Review PH, and email us, toprankreview.abudabi at gmail.com. And if you want to contact us, please contact our uh, Philippine mobile number and for UAE mobile number. Thank you so much and uh, welcome to our free lecture series. Hi everyone, good day po. So I'd like to greet everybody. Good day, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to Top Rank International as we will be conducting our free lecture series for today. And uh, okay, the title of our discussion would be uh, about uh, physiologic adaptation. Right, so I hope that everybody who is viewing live on Facebook and on YouTube, okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining with us. Okay, uh, I believe that I have, uh, yes, I, I have lots of students here in the room. So can I see a thumbs up? Okay, if you are now ready for the discussion, All right, thumbs up, oh guys. Okay, if you can hear me clearly, kindly send your thumbs up sign. All right, so I hope that you could uh, be able to view okay, my presentation for today. Okay, all right. So thank you very much for joining. I'll try to change the setting of my laptop so that I could be able to see everybody. All right. So let's start our discussion for today. So for today, okay, I'll be starting with a quote, okay? A quote that says, in top rank, we believe the top results require top ambition. So here in Top Rank Review Academy, we are valuing excellence. And we do not settle for less, okay, or being a mediocre, but rather we would want to achieve excellence in whatever things that we will be doing. So that is why here in Top Rank International, say for example in NCLEX, okay, we have a hundred percent success rate together with UK CBT and Middle East exam preparation. Not only that, because majority or ninety percent of our candidates are stopping for their NCLEX exam at a minimum number of items. So usually at 75, okay, the computer is stopping. So for today, let me discuss to you about uh, physiologic adaptation 
the, the, the hot topics, okay, that is most commonly appearing in the actual question. So by the way, my name is Jeremy Cabanez. I am the Program Director of Top Rank International. And for today, we'll be discussing about hot topics that can appear in the actual exam. I, I, I know that some of you have their schedules, ATPs, or eligibility, or is waiting for the approval. So therefore, it is the best time for you to start your review preparation. Okay, so this would be a test-based approach. So for those of you who are here in, uh, in the room, I'll be asking you to unmute your mic and you will be reading the question. So this would be an interactive one. So I'll be facilitating and we will be okay, arriving at the correct answer. Okay, so I'll be starting with our okay, first candidate for today. So I'll ask Ms. Franz. Ms. Franz, can you read the first question? Are you there? Number one. Hello, Miss France. Are you around? Hello. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So a psychiatric client will be transferred to the medical unit. The client should be roomed together with the patient who is recovering from a right. thrombocytopenia. Uh, two, thrombocytosis, three, increased WBC, and four, neutropenia. All right. Thank you, Ms. Franz, for reading. So therefore, let's talk about the main topic for today. Okay, The main topic is all about, since you are asked about rooming together, what do we mean by rooming together? The main topic, we identify first the topic, and that's called cohorting. Okay, now cohorting is very common for those with a communicable disease. However, please take note that on your task question, we are not talking about a communicable disease, but instead we are talking about a psych patient. Okay, guys, okay, do we have okay the specific condition? The answer is no. Okay, so it is not identified what type of psych condition is present, but you are asked about the cohort. Now, okay, on this case, okay, you are asked about, okay, up, 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 the following clients that can be cohorted with the psych patient. So as you can see, guys, in numbers one, two, three, and four, what do you observe? You are observing a hematologic problem. So therefore, cohorting a patient, okay, a psych patient together with those clients with a hematologic or known as those with a blood discretion. Okay, so let's take a look. Let's talk about numbers one and two. Numbers one and two, you could use the strategy, okay, grouping or clustering. So we could cluster one and two. Why? Because both of which are referring to thrombocytes. So thrombocytes are also known as platelets. Okay, next, let's talk about your three and four. So as you can see on your three and four, the increased WBC and neutropenia are referring to what? Leukocytes. Neutrophils, which is the most abundant of all, okay, of all, okay, of all your leukocytes, or also known as your white blood cells. All right, so therefore, okay, you can group together, is it thrombocytes or WBCs? Okay, now, how are you going to attack the question? To attack the question, you could select which one, okay, could be grouped together with a client, okay, who has a side condition. Of course, guys, you are going to eliminate those that has a problem with thrombocytes or platelets. Okay, why? Because some of the clients or most of the clients, okay, because most of the clients who are admitted in the psych unit are considered as combative or aggressive. So if they are aggressive and hostile in nature, what would be? Okay, what would be the problem? For thrombocytopenia, okay, it could result into bleeding conditions. So immediately, I'm going to eliminate number one. Okay, <laughs> number two, I can eliminate number two because that injury can result into a clot formation. So therefore, is it safe to admit a side client together with a platelet condition? The answer is no, because of the risk for injury, bleeding, and clot formation. All right, so you are torn now between, okay, your two okay, options. So we have the increased WBC and neutropenia. Come on, guys, use the chat box, okay, provided to you, and answer the question, which type of client, okay, or which type of patient should be roomed together with a side client? Should it be number three or number four? Okay, should it be number three or number four? I can see, uh, okay, answers now. How about the others? Okay, don't be shy. Just key in your answers. No judgment, but I will be, okay, I'll be discussing the correct answer later on. So if your answers are wrong, there's no problem with that. But if your answers are correct, there's no problem with it also. 
Okay. So this is a learning opportunity for you guys. You can use the chat box. Okay, so for those who are new in Zoom, you have just to, you just need to click the chat button and then you need to place your answers. All right, so I can see five answers. How about the others? Okay, for those who are in YouTube or Facebook, hi to all of you. You can also write down your answers on the comment section. Okay, so let's proceed with the correct answer. So what would be the best answer? Should it be increased WBC? Now, what do you remember about increased WBC? When we talk about increased WBC or leukocytosis, what is the major concern? The major concern for increased WBC is the presence of inflammation. Remember that. If there is an increased WBC, there is an inflammation or there is a presence of infection. While when we talk about neutropenia, neutropenia is a patient who is an immunosuppressed. Okay, so we are calling it as immunosuppression and what would be the nursing diagnosis risk for infection. There is no infection yet, but a client is at risk for infection. Okay, so let's proceed. Which one would be the best answer? Okay, the correct answer, it should be... Okay, it should be number four. I'm sorry for your answer, guys. But the correct answer should be number four. Why? Because if it's a psych patient, okay, psych patients are receiving medications, right? So say, for example, they are receiving antipsychotic. Now, whenever they are receiving antipsychotic, say, for example, okay, there are two types of antipsychotic, right? So we have what we call the typical antipsychotic. These are the drugs that ends in dole. Say, for example, haloperidol, haldol, right? What else? You have also your uh, flufenazine, chlorpromazine, thorazine. So drugs that ends in dol and zine. Another antipsychotic would be atypical. So when we talk about atypical antipsychotic, these are the drugs that ends in zapine, clozapine, olanzapine, right? Okay, what else? These are the drugs that ends in dol. Risperidone, ciprazidone, all right? So therefore, what do you remember on these drugs? Okay, particularly when the client is taking a typical antipsychotic, one of its adverse effects is agranulocytosis. Uh, what do you mean by agranulocytosis as its adverse effect? The zapine drugs. This is very particular if the client is taking clozapine or clozaril. So what do we mean by agranulocytosis? Amin's absence. Absence of granulocytes. Cytosis means many. So it's the absence of many granulocytes or also known as neutropenia. So therefore, we cannot room the psychiatric patient to a patient with an infection or inflammation because, okay, what would happen? There could be a transfer of the microorganism. So number three is considered as unsafe, right? So therefore, the best answer is number four since both of them are immunosuppressed. All right, so that could be a good try. Guys, this is an actual question that has recently appeared in the actual question. So here in Top Rank Review Academy, what we are discussing most especially in the final coaching are the hot trends, okay, or the topic that is most commonly appearing in the actual question. All right, so let's proceed now with question number Two. Good try, guys, but we are going to answer the next question. Okay, let's have question number two. Can I ask somebody to read this for me? Let's have Alfonso. Alfonso, kindly. Hello, Alfonso. Sorry, we cannot hear you clearly. All right, so I, I, I'm, I'm going to get back to you in a while. Okay, I'll fix your audio first because I cannot hear you. All right, so, so I'm going to ask Mar. Okay, Mar, are you around? Can you please read the question number two? You can unmute your mic and then read the question. No, sir. Uh, okay, go ahead. Caring... Yes, ma'am. The nurse is caring for the several clients in a medical surgical suite unit. Which client should the nurse see first? All right, what thank you, Mar, for reading. I okay, so be, before you read, before yeah. you read, let's identify first the main topic. All right. Thank you, Mar. Okay. First, you. we are asked about, okay, which of the clients should the nurse see first? Thank you, Mar. Okay. So see first means, okay, Mar, you are asked about prioritization. So the main topic, okay, the main topic is all about prioritization. Okay. So in prioritization, we'll be using strategies. And what would be the strategies that we are going to use? Answer. The favorite strategy in top rank methodology is your stable versus unstable. 
So you will, are going to look the most unstable client. Question, how do we know that the condition is unstable? The condition is considered as unstable if the client has a problem of A, B, C, plus B. Remember, our priority is the most unstable client because these clients are clients who are presenting with a disorder or a problem related to airway, breathing, circulation, and vital signs. Not only that, these are the clients with a crisis situation. Next, let's talk about now your another strategy. Another strategy that you could use is your strategy of expected versus unexpected. Okay, guys, which one should be your priority? Your priority would be the most unexpected condition. And what do we mean by unexpected? It means to say that the client is experiencing complication. So therefore, if the client has complication, is the condition improving or worsening? Okay, you have to take note that the client is worsening condition. So therefore, we have to take note who among the following clients should the nurse see first. Okay, Mark, can you please read the options? Number one. Mark, are you around? Number a child one, with crying in pain. Two, okay. a client with delirium who is lethargic. Three, an mm -hmm. asthmatic woman with audible wheezes or a COPD client with pulse oximetry reading of 89%. All right, guys, before I, I rationalize, please key in your answers. Okay. I need to see your answers on the chat box provided as we are going to answer the question. Guys, kindly key in your answers, which one should be the most unstable and which one has an unexpected condition. Let's try to answer this one in prioritization. Okay. Can you please, okay, write your answers? Okay. So we have a few answers from the group. I hope that everybody is participating so that this would be interactive. Okay, good try. Okay, let's start our rationalization. Number one, a child who is crying in pain. Remember, what would be the condition? Crying and pain. Okay, now remember, okay, do we have other manifestation? The answer, no. Right, we don't have any other manifestation, but we just have pain. Oh, remember, is the intensity of pain given? The answer no. Is the pain related to a crisis? It is not stated that the child is in crisis. Remember, okay, if the child is in crisis, it's not only crying. Remember, it's not only crying, but if the patient has a severe condition, therefore, there would be a danger sign. Everybody, how do we know that if in a child there is a danger sign? Okay, how do we know that it is a priority? Okay, come on, guys. Let's talk about the danger signs for zero to five years. What do you remember in your IMCA class? Okay, integrated management of childhood illness. It says there that you need to check for the presence of danger signs for children. We call this as CUVA. You remember CUVA? C for convulsion, right? Letter U, if the baby or the child is unable to feed or breastfeed, they are not eating anything. Letter B, vomits everything. They cannot hold anything. Okay, either fluids or medication. Everything okay, goes out. Next, letter A, if the child is abnormally sleepy or difficulty to awaken. This is also known as apathy. This is also known as apathy. So therefore, do we have apathy on the scenario? No, the child is just crying in pain. Is crying a danger sign? Yes or no? No. If the child is sick, is crying expected or unexpected? Crying is expected. And according to Saunders, pain is not the first priority. Why? The first priority is airway, breathing, circulation, and vital signs, right? So definitely, this is considered as a second level priority. So I am going to eliminate number one. Sorry for those who have answered number one. Next, let's talk about question number two. A client with delirium who is lethargic. A client with delirium who is lethargic. Okay, keyword, we have what we call delirium. Okay, and we have what we call lethargy. What do you mean by lethargy? This is a decreasing LOC. All right, now question, what do we mean by delirium? In delirium, the main concern in delirium is an altered mental status. Remember, what would be the cause of the altered mental status? It is caused by various conditions. It is caused by a medical or an organic syndrome. This is caused by a medical 
or an organic syndrome. Okay, so basically, okay, what's the difference between delirium and dementia? Delirium and Alzheimer's disease. In delirium, the altered mental status is just acute. The altered mental status is just acute. What do we mean by this? Okay, and when to say that when we treat the medical or the organic sy sy symptoms, then definitely, okay, the condition will also be treated. Now, the word lethargy is a decreasing LOC. Question, is a decreasing LOC, okay, your priority? What, okay, the Sonder emphasize. According to Saunders, this is called an altered or a decreasing LOC. And an altered LOC is just included on the second level priority. It is just included on the second. Why? Number two should only be prioritized if that is already a comma condition. Remember that. It should only be prioritized if that is already a comma condition. Why? Okay. Because a comma condition is now a problem of circulation to the brain, which is a vital organ. So letter G starting to decline first, but it's not your top priority because letter G is common in delirium. Question, is, the, is letter G expected or unexpected for delirium? Again, this is expected. So I should eliminate number two. Okay, so we are now left with three versus four. Everybody, please answer my question. Should it be number three or number four? All of your answers have been eliminated already. What happened, guys? Okay, it's fine. This is a learning opportunity for everybody. Please key in. Given, okay, the two, okay, options that is left with us, which one should be our top priority? Mm -hmm. All right. Any other answers aside from Mars answers? Okay. Please key in your answers, guys. Okay, so that I could check. All right, so let's see. Okay, number three. An asthmatic woman with audible whizzes. What do you remember about asthma? In bronchial asthma, there is airway obstruction caused by exposure to allergens. So what is happening? There is bronchospasm and possibly bronchoconstriction. This is the reason why wheezes is present. So therefore, this is an airway concern. Okay, so if it's an airway concern, stable versus unstable, this could be unstable. So I'm going to place a question mark in number three. How about number four? A COPD client with pulse oximeter reading of 89%. Oops. Remember, the pulse ox reading is 89%. COPD is a chronic condition. Yes, this is chronic, and chronic condition is not a priority. However, the oxygen saturation of the client is already less than 90. Remember, if it's less than 90, this is an impending respiratory failure. If it's less than 90, this is an impending respiratory failure. Is lungs a vital organ? Of course, I'm going to place question mark in number four. Let's see what would be the best answer the best answer should be number four <laughs> the best uh, congratulations to those who got the correct answer okay Heidi okay uh, we have uh, uh, K Rance. We have also Miss Jasper and Norlinda. Very good. So you, you've got the correct answer because this is an impending respiratory failure. Why not number three? Because wheezes is expected in a patient with asthma. Remember, wheezes is expected in a patient with asthma. When do we prioritize asthma? Asthma should be prioritized when the wheezes disappear. <laughs> asthma, okay, should be prioritized when wheezes. Why? When the wheezes disappear and there is no audible breath sound, it is an indication of a severe swelling. And a severe swelling and inflammation leads to, okay, airway obstruction. Thus, there is what we call decreased pulmonary compliance. It can result into lung collapse. So therefore, in number three, this is not yet a status, a status asthmaticus condition. This is not yet a status asthmaticus condition. This is not an emergency because this is expected of them. So the best answer should be number four. Okay, guys, are you learning? Yes, is everybody learning in Top Rank Review Academy? Can I see a thumbs up from everybody? If we're good in question number two. Okay, good job, guys. All right, let's talk about your question number three. Okay, so make bowe on this, huh? So because you did a wrong answer in a respiratory condition, another respiratory question will be thrown to you. Okay, can I ask somebody to read this for me? Can we have... Uh, Heidi, are you around? Can you please unmute your mic and read question number three? Miss Heidi? You have your microphone with you. Hello? Okay, it seems Heidi has no microphone. All right, so let's proceed with another candidate. 
I'm sorry for that. Okay. So let's have, can I ask Miss Kiara? Kiara, are you around? Miss Kiara, number three, please. The HCP ordered an ABG specimen for a client with worsening pulmonary edema. The RN will first determine if the site is patent by performing the correct sequence in order. Drag and drop. All right. Thank you, Kiara, for reading the question. First, the main topic is all about an ABG specimen, arterial blood gas. And of course, first, before the ABG specimen withdrawal, we need first to determine if the site is patent. Question, what is the test performed if you are going to determine if, okay, the, if the arteries are patent? Can you tell me, guys? That is talking about, okay, remember in the actual exam, they will not giving you a spoon-fed topic. They will not be spoon feeding all of the nurses, but rather you have to analyze the situation. Okay, very good, Miss France. You hit it correctly. You are asked to perform an Allen's test. Very good. Now, in Allen's test, we determine if the site is patent. So, therefore, you're asked about the correct sequence. So, let's read. Okay, before we, we, we proceed, we, we, we shall be reading the, 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 the options. Number one, release the pressure. Number two, encourage to open the hand. Number three, instruct the client to make a test. And number four, occlude the ulnar and radial arteries. Okay, so what do you think would be the first thing that you will be doing? Of course, you will first okay, perform number, number four, occlude the ulnar and radial arteries, right? And then, okay, after you occlude, What's the next thing that you will be doing? You need to what? You need to, okay, instruct the client to make a fist and then encourage to open the hand simultaneously. So make a fist, open the hand simultaneously so that the palms would be pale in nature. And after the, the hands will become pale, that's the time that you could release the pressure. And releasing the pressure will, okay, have the reversal of the perfusion. So if the perfusion is reversed, then it will turn back into its original state. So therefore, what would be the correct answer for the Allen's test? The correct answers are numbers four, three, two, and one. So that's what we call the drug and drop. If you are asked about, you write it in a, in uh, you have to place a number for each option. Then you could also answer this is number one, followed by number two, followed by number three, or number four. But if it's drag and drop, you are going to what? To place, okay, the option from the left box into the right box and then arrange it simultaneously. So this should be the correct answer. All right, I hope that you got this correctly. This is very basic. Okay, so definitely let's talk about question number four. I hope you got this correctly. Okay, let's talk about another question. Let's talk about number four. Okay, for question number four, can I ask Miss Jasper to read question number four? Miss Jasper, hello. Okay, question number four. A client with congestive heart failure has been prescribed with digoxine or lanoxine. Which laboratory test should be monitored? All right, thank you, Miss Jasper, for reading the question. First, we have what we call the digoxine. Okay, it's a treatment for a patient with CHF. Okay, now what do you remember about digoxin and lanoxin? This is under, okay, digitalis or also known as cardiac glycoside. Okay, this is also known as a cardiac glycoside and its indication is a patient with a congestive heart failure. Now tell me what would be the action of the drug. The action of the drug, according to your reference says, it boosts calcium ion within the myocardium. What does it do? It will now boost the calcium ion within the myocardium. So what does it do? It will it will cause the calcium ion to have an influx, to have an influx. Remember, calcium is important for the contraction, right? So therefore, if this would be, okay, the action of the drug, what would be its primary effect? Okay, primary effect of the drug, of course, it can result into a positive inotropic effect. Okay, what do you remember about a positive inotropic effect? Since, okay, the calcium enters within the myocardium, when we talk about positive inotropy, it will increase the force of myocardial contractility. 
it will increase the force of myocardial contractility. So what does it mean? It increases now the preload. It will now increase the preload. What do we mean by the preload? Preload is the degree of ventricular stretch. It is the degree of the ventricular stretch. It will cause ventricular filling, everybody, so that there would be an effective contraction. The ventricles of the heart should be stretched. Stretch before it will pump. That's what they call increase in preload. Definitely, there would be increased ventricular filling. Stretch first, fill with blood before it will pump. So that's what they call a positive inotropic effect. Another thing. However, it is also a negative chronotropic effect. Now, what do we mean by a negative chronotropic effect? Negative chronotropic effect means it will okay, decrease the heart rate. Why? Because it takes time for the ventricles to be filled. Why? Because it takes time for the ventricles to be filled. So it needs to be stretched, right, before it will pump. So it will take time. So therefore, what will happen? It will now increase the force of the contraction. It will increase the cardiac output. However, it will decrease the heart rate. So therefore, what is an important nursing intervention before getting the drug? Of course, you check the heart rate. Right? Do not give if the heart rate is what? If the heart rate is less than 60 in adult. Please take note the age of your client. Okay, if it's adult, less than 60. If it's a child, please take note, okay, that a child has a different sets of heart rate. Their heart rate would be higher, right? So therefore, do not give if bradycardic, less than 60 or bradycardia. Okay, why? It can further decrease the heart rate. That is why cardiac glycoside or digoxin can also be a treatment for those with a tachycardia condition. Okay, next, another thing. Aside from a, a negative chronotropy, the chronotropic effect, it is also a negative dromotropic effect. What do we mean by a negative dromotropic effect? Okay, it will slow down the conduction time. It will slow down the conduction time. So therefore, what would be a possible adverse effect? The possible adverse effect, it can result into an arrhythmia or also known as heart block. It can result into arrhythmia or also known as heart block. Right? So this is the major concern. So what would be your nursing intervention? Nursing intervention, we monitor the ECG. We monitor the ECG. Taking note, if there would be a prolonged PR interval or a heart block or there would be a skip bit because this is one of the adverse effects of the drug. Okay, so are we clear now? Yes? All right, next. Another important intervention when you are giving digoxin, since okay, it has a narrow therapeutic index, you monitor for the normal therapeutic value of the drug. So what's the normal therapeutic value? Okay, if you will be taking UK CBT and middle is exam, that would be 0.5 to 2 NG per ml. Okay. How about for NCLEX? Okay. For NCLEX, that would be 0.6 to 1.2 microgram per dl. Okay. We have a different set of a normal value because we have a different what? Okay. Unit of measurement. So for UKCBT and and uh, middle is exam, he'll be using 0.5 to 2. But for those who will be taking the NCLEX, that would be 0.6 to 1.2. Right? Okay. So therefore, it is very narrow. So what does it mean? This drug is potentially toxic. Okay. This drug is potentially toxic. So therefore, okay, you need to take note about its normal value because there is a risk of toxicity. So I'm going to discuss about toxicity. I hope that you can copy this one before I proceed with my whiteboard. Everybody have a screenshot of this so that you would have a copy or have your notebooks with you so that you could copy about the joxin. This is pharmacology, right? Okay, so I'm going to proceed with my, with my whiteboard as I will be dis discussing about the digoxin toxicity. Now, if you would be asked about the toxicity, what would be the potential causes? Okay, the causes would be the following. Answer, okay, toxicity, okay, toxicity may occur, okay? Toxicity may occur in the presence of the following. Answer, first, in the presence of hypokalemia in the presence of hypokalemia, okay? Why? Okay, because hypokalemia will cause, okay, definitely there would be a blockage of the metabolism of digoxin. So there is a certain enzyme that could be affected, okay, when we talk about the metabolism of the drug. So therefore, this hypokalemia will block, okay, that metabolism. Therefore, what could happen? The metabolites or the end product of the drug will increase. So therefore, what would be your health change? Since hypokalemia can cause toxicity, you have to teach a low potassium intake. 
right? You have to teach about low potassium intake. So therefore, when we talk about low potassium intake, you need to limit the intake of what? It's not to avoid everything. It's not to restrict, but only to limit fresh fruits and vegetables. So say, for example, we have your uh, broccoli. What else? We have also strawberries, Okay, citrus fruits, avocados, and bananas, which are, okay, considered as high in potassium, you need to limit them. All right, next, what else aside from the presence of hypokalemia? Another causes, okay, of this would be your interaction, okay? What would be that fruit that can cause an interaction leading to toxicity? Answer, grapefruit. So what would be your healthy chain? Avoid taking grapefruit together with the drug because of the risk of toxicity. Again, this grapefruit will affect the metabolism of digoxin leading to high level of digoxin in the body. Okay, leading to high level of digoxin in the body. Okay, next, let's talk about another electrolyte imbalance. Okay, another electrolyte imbalance that may result into toxicity is the presence of hypercalcemia. Okay, in the presence of hypercalcemia. Okay, why? Because in the presence of hypercalcemia, the kidneys will have difficulty eliminating the byproduct. The kidney will have difficulty in eliminating byproduct and the kidney will choose whether to eliminate the calcium or to eliminate the digoxin. So therefore, okay, the hypercalcemia can also lead into toxicity together with hypermagnesemia. Together with hypermagnesemia. Okay, the same is true. So the kidney will be choosing whether to eliminate the magnesium exhaust or the end product of, okay, digoxin. Okay, next, let's talk about the signs and symptoms of toxicity. Now, remember, when we talk about signs and symptoms, everything goes out. Remember, there is a toxins in the body. There is a toxin in the body. If there would be toxins in the body, the body will compensate. And that's the beauty of our body. The body will try to find out Whenever there is toxicity, the body will try to eliminate everything. So therefore, remember, for toxicity, everything goes out. So we have the mnemonic VANDA. So we'll be using VANDA as the signs and symptoms. Let's talk about letter V. Letter V stands for visual disturbances. Visual disturbances. Okay, usually what they could see on their, on their field of vision, they could see a grin or a yellow spot, a green or yellow spot. So if you see green or yellow spot, that's a red flag, right? Across the field of vision, because that could be an indication of, of toxicity and at the same time, blurred vision. Okay, next, let's talk about letter A, anorexia. Do you remember everything goes out? Nothing goes in. Everything goes out. Nothing goes in. So the client will not be able to take, okay, the food. Okay, letter N for nausea because everything goes out. Diarrhea. And finally, letter A stands for abdominal pain. Why? Because so that to get rid of those toxins, there would be an increase in peristaltic movement. And that increase in peristaltic movement in the GI tract can lead into cramping. And that cramping leads to abdominal pain. So therefore, these are the signs and symptoms of toxins. Now, question, what would be the antidote, okay, that the nurse should prepare at bedside before notifying the physician you have prepared? Anticipate for the antidote. The answer is Digipine. Brand name, Digipine. All right. So definitely those are the signs and symptoms of toxicity. Now that I have mentioned, okay, these, okay, then definitely you can now answer the question. All right. Let's go back on the question. Again, what's the main topic? The main topic is all about digoxin, right? Now, you are asked laboratory tests that you should be monitoring. So, therefore, what you should monitor, okay, question, should you monitor your renal function? Yes or no? Yes, because if the renal function is affected, see, for example, a decreased GFR. If there is a decreased GFR, again, it will not be able to eliminate the, okay, digoxin in the body. It will accumulate. So, that is why, okay, it can result into toxicity. So, definitely, that should be included. Okay, come on, guys. Hemoglobin, is it included? Do we have anemia as its adverse effect? No, I did not discuss any anemia at all. We have platelets. Okay, is platelets also affected? No, blood component is not affected. Potassium, should you monitor? Of course, because the presence of hypokalemia and result into toxicity. Magnesium, yes, because the presence of hypermagnesium yeah, can result into toxicity. If calcium is also included, then you should also include. This is, again, a hot topic in the actual exam. So what would be the best answer? One, two, five, and six. 
So that's how are you going to answer, select all that of high question. Remember, guys, there are various methods of skinning the cat, but definitely nothing beats knowing the correct answer. <laughs> if you know the concept, okay, if you know the concept and you know about the drug, then definitely you would be able to answer these questions correctly. Okay, can I see a thumbs up from everybody? We are clear with question number four. Very easy if you know the concept. The problem is if you don't know the concept, if you did not read your books, right? Okay, so that is why in Top Rank if you Academy, we are here to simplify the textbooks for you. All right, let's talk about now your question number five. Okay, can I ask Miss Norlinda? Miss Norlinda, can you please read the question? Miss Norlinda, hello. Go ahead, Pop. Hello, Ma'am Norlinda. Do you have a microphone? No. Nope. Okay, go ahead. Sir, uh, a client with systemic lupus erythematosus, SLA, is seen in the outpatient clinic. What can the nurse observe? All right, thank you, Ma'am Norlinda. Okay, thank you for reading. First, let's try to identify first the main topic. And the main topic is your SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus. Okay. Now, SLE is what condition? This is an autoimmune okay, condition that involves inflammation. Autoimmune that involves inflammation. Inflammation of okay, connective tissues. Okay, so it involves the inflammation of connective tissues. This is the cause of death of uh, one of our former president, right? You remember Ferdinand Marcos who had this condition. So SLE, it's an autoimmune condition characterized by inflammation of connective tissues. And remember, okay, there are various organs that can be affected by SLE. So therefore, your SLE is also known as the great imitator. So that is why SLE is called the great imitator. Why? Because the bodies are made up of connective tissues. Example, the skin, the joints, the bones, the blood vessels, they are all made of connective tissues, right? Okay, now tell me what would be the risk factors associated with SLE, risk factors, okay. This is most commonly seen among women. Although men can also have this condition, but women has a greater risk. Okay, who else? Women who are of young age, 20 to 40 years old. And what would be the precipitating factor to its autoimmunity? Autoimmune means autoimmune self, self-destruction. This is exacerbated by stress. So remember, autoimmunity, okay, or stress can result into auto-destruction. So therefore, you are asked about what can the nurse observe? So therefore, you are asked about assessment. Okay, when we talk about assessment, signs and symptoms, okay? Or not only signs and symptoms, but rather what could be also the complications that can be seen. Complications that can be seen. Okay, so therefore, let's use our mnemonic, signs and symptoms for SLE. There would be 90% sensitivity and specificity if you have three or more of the following condition. Three or more of the following conditions. So I'm going to use my mnemonic. I'd love to use mnemonic. Okay, soap, rain, MDH. I am going to use my mnemonic, soap, rain, MDH. Okay, come on. Let's use the mnemonic, soap, rain, MDH. Assessment finding. Let's start with your letter S. Letter S stands for serositis. Letter S stands for serositis. What do we mean by serositis? Okay, when we talk about serositis, that would be the inflammation of the serous membrane. What are the serous membrane? Example, the lung pleura, the pericardium, or serous membrane. So what could you see? Okay, there could be pleuritis or pericarditis as its complication. Okay, next, letter O stands for oral ulcers. Letter A stands for arthralgia, joint pain. Why? Because the joints are made of connective tissues. Next, letter B for photosensitivity. So can you see something on their skin? Yes. Rushes that can be caused by sunlight. Rushes that because when they are exposed to sunlight, then definitely the skin can be damaged. That's what we call photosensitivity. Guys, photophobia is different from photosensitivity. Photophobia is the fear of the eyes from being exposed to bright lights. Photosensitivity, there would be a presence of skin damage when you are exposed to sunlight. Okay, next, let's talk about your letter R. Letter R stands for 
renal disorders. Renal disorders are, is also known as your lupus nephritis. And remember, lupus nephritis is the cause of death. Lupus no, nephritis is the cause of death. Not only renal disorder, but they can also develop Raynaud's phenomenon. Why? Because the arteries or the blood vessels are made up of connective tissues. So when it is inflamed, what can happen? The blood flow to the arteries of the hands can be affected. So do you remember Raynaud's? In Raynaud's, okay, it can happen when they are exposed into what? Precipitated by cold exposure and stress. So when they are exposed to cold and stress, then therefore what can happen to their, to their hands? Their hands will develop a triphasic manifestation. What do we mean by triphasic discoloration? They have the word tri. Tri means three colors. And what are the three colors? It becomes pale. Okay, it becomes pale or white. It becomes cyanotic or blue. And of course, red. So we have what we call the white, blue, and red. That's what we call the triphasic discoloration common in Raynaud's phenomenon. All right, next, let's talk about letter A. Letter A stands for the presence of positive in the laboratory anti-nuclear antibodies. Okay, letter I, they have immunologic disorders. So therefore, they have a weak immune system. Letter N for a neurologic disorder. Why? Because the brain is also made of all blood vessels. So that is why seizure condition can also be observed. Letter M for malarash. Letter D for a discoid rush. Okay, these rushes, mala rush and discoid rush, could be seen where? Into the cheek and to the nose bridge. Into the cheek and into the nose bridge. That is why this is the hallmark condition. And what would be the hallmark sign? We call it as the butterfly rush. So if you can see a butterfly rush, that's an indication. However, it will not appear in the actual question because that's very easy. It's already known to you, right? So definitely letter H, hematologic disorder. So therefore, let's use your elimination given, okay, the topics or the, the signs and symptoms that I have discussed. So what would be the signs and symptoms? Answer, so brain MDA. So definitely number one, sclerodactyly. What is sclerodactyly? This is the thickening of the skin. And thickening of the skin, is it observed in SLE? According to research, it's not observed to SLE. However, it can be seen into what condition? It is seen in a patient with scleroderma. So sclerodactyly, very very good. Commonly observed, scleroderma. So let's eliminate number one. Number two, Bouchard's nodes, Heberden's nodes. Oops, you know for a fact that these nodes are commonly seen in a patient with osteoarthritis. Okay, so definitely what will be the correct answer? It's there on our discussion. The correct answer should be number four, Raynaud's phenomenon. All right, are we clear about SLE? Learning, guys. Okay, are you learning now? Can I see a thumbs up if everything is clear related to question number five? Okay, good job. All right, let's talk about now your question number six. Okay, let's try to analyze question number six. Okay, can I ask somebody to read this for me? Okay, can I call on, okay, Karen's. Karen's, are you around? Kindly unmute your mic, please, Karen's. Karen's Cabral. Hello, sir. Sir or ma'am, hello. Sir, yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, go ahead. A nurse is caring for a client who has undergone partial gastrectomy. Which statement would tell the nurse that the client has a correct understanding of the procedure? Okay, thank you. Okay, the first topic is your surgical management, partial gastrectomy. Okay, now what would be that? What is partial gastrectomy? Ectomy means removal, surgical removal of the stomach, but it's not a total, it's only partially. So, definitely, this is also known as your Bill Roth procedure. Do you remember the Bill Roth? Yes, we have what we call the Bill Roth one and the Bill Roth two. Okay, what do we mean by a Bill Roth one and a Bill Roth two? Okay, and when we talk about a Bill Roth one procedure, okay, that is what we call your gastro duodenostomy, right? So we are going to remove the stomach and the stomach will be anastomosed directly into the duodenum, right? Say, for example, if the patient has cancer and part of the stomach should be removed, right? Okay, next, another indication for ulceration. If there is a peptic ulcer bleeding, then it should be removed and then it will be anastomosed. Okay, next, we have also your bill root rule, gastro jejunostomy, right? So those are what we call your partial gastrectomy. Okay, now you are asked about correct understanding. 
So remember, it's only partial. Not all of the stomach will be removed. So correct understanding means positive or negative. This is a positive one. So you're asked about the true statement. So therefore, what strategy are we going to apply? You will be applying true or false. Okay, let's read. Number one, I may be able to eat again in time. So what do you think? This is true or false? The answer, this is a true statement. Why can the client eat in time? The client can eat in time because it is just removed partially. So therefore, when okay, the wound heals already, then therefore the client may be able to eat again so remember okay that initially the client will be placed on a large bore to bedding okay so initially okay post operatively the patient will be placed on a large bore large bore ngt why large bore ngt what would be the purpose number one that ngt will be for the purpose of lavage Lavage. What do you mean by lavage? That is your gastric decompression. Remember, there would be increased acid in the area. So therefore, there would be bloating. And that bloating can affect the suture. Okay, It can affect the incision site, right? So therefore, it can lead into enzyme leakage. So to prevent that from occurring, to prevent this tension, they will be placed on a large bore NGT first for lavage. And after which the client can be also be fed using that NGT. And then when healing occurs, that's the time that the patient may be able to eat again. Okay, so question, what would be the most common complication? Okay, the most common complication associated with gastrectomy is called the dumping syndrome. Do you remember dumping syndrome? Everybody, I'll be explaining dumping syndrome. This is very common in the actual exam. In dumping syndrome, this is characterized by rapid emptying of the stomach. I repeat, what's the definition? Rapid emptying of the stomach. Since the stomach is already small, so by the pull of gravity, it can be emptied immediately. So therefore, from the stomach, it will go now into the intestine. Remember, stomach is helpful to grind the food. Stomach is helpful in the mechanical digestion of the food. So therefore, if the food is undigested from the stomach and if okay, it is emptied and is diverted into the intestines immediately, what can happen? The intestines will have difficulty to digest the food. The intestines will have difficulty in digesting food. So if the intestines has difficulty, the intestine needs help. It will cry uh, out loud for help, right? So therefore, what can happen? The, the blood supply from the vital organs, the blood supply from the vital organs will be shunted into the intestines. So the blood from the brain, the blood from the heart, the blood from the lungs, the blood from the skin or the lower extremities where it will be shunted into the intestine because the intestine is crying for help. So therefore, if all of the blood will be there in the intestine, what would be the typical manifestations? Answer, they will suffer from a shock-like symptoms. Shock-like okay, features. So what would be the shock-like features? Hypotension, tachycardia, palpitation, cold, clammy skin, right? So therefore, that would be life-threatening, most especially the hypotension. Okay, so therefore, okay, nursing intervention, what would be our advice? Our advice, what would be the best position for fitting the answer? So pine or flat, okay, position after meals. So after a meals, the client should be on bed rest. In a supine, flat after meals, bed rest. Avoid ambulation after a meals because ambulation can lead to gravity pull. So definitely, they should avoid ambulation. What type of food that you will be giving? What should be the diet? Answer, it should be a high protein. Avoid simple sugar. It should be high protein. Avoid simple sugar because protein gives mass. It gives weight. So when it gives weight, it will not be emptied immediately. So the stomach will not be emptied. So if you give simple sugar, that could be emptied immediately. So juices should be avoided. All right. Next, what else? It should be, okay, it should also include small frequent meals. Small, avoid large meals, small frequent meals. And of course, it should be fluids or water. Okay, after meals. Should not be during meals because it could be emptied. It should not be during meals because the stomach can be emptied. So definitely, those are the important nursing intervention post-gastrectomy. Questions about this one? So number one, it could be the true statement. So probably number one could be a good answer. Next, let's talk about number two. 
I will have a permanent colostomy. True or false? This is false. Colostomy is only applied whenever the client is for colectomy. What is colectomy? Surgical removal of a colon. So there is no colon that is removed. So definitely that's not related. Number three, I will be fed through a tube all of my life. Question, is the tube inserted for a lifetime? The answer is no. Why? Because the, the, okay, the stomach is still present. Okay? So definitely the word all of my life is wrong. It would only be performed initially. Number four, I can enjoy my favorite citrus sherbet. What do you mean by sherbet? It's a form of an ice cream. So therefore, ice cream is high protein or high in sugar. It is high in sugar. So definitely that should be avoided. So the correct answer should be number one. Okay. Number one is the best answer. Okay. Moving forward, guys, before we, we proceed, is everybody learning? Is everybody learning? For those who are in YouTube and Facebook, and for those who are here in our okay, in our Zoom classroom, okay, can I see a thumbs up? Okay, thank you. Okay, for those who gave their thumbs up, let's talk about question number seven. Okay, it's only fifteen items. Don't you worry. Okay, let's have number seven. Okay, which let's have Miss Liana. Miss Liana, can you read question number seven, please? Miss Liana from Top Rank Season 2. Section 2, rather. Which client should the nurse in the emergency department see first? All right, One, so let's... Uh, okay, okay, thank you, Miss Liana. Okay, so before we proceed, let's have first, okay, the analysis. And the main topic is all about see first. Uh, bago mo basahin yung option, you need first to analyze what is being asked of you. And what is being asked of an emergency nurse is to see first. So therefore, okay, you need to use prioritization. Everybody, in prioritization, which one should the nurse see first? Of course, I'm going to see the most critical, the most unstable with an unexpected condition, emergency or critical. All right, so let's proceed. Let's have number one, patient taking lysinopril having a headache. Okay, question. What do you mean by a lysinopril? What is this drug? Lysinopril, pril, drugs that ends in pril. Captopril. Lysinopril. Enalapril. What do you remember? These are called ACE inhibitors. Okay, what is an ACE inhibitor? This is an anti-hypertensive drug. What does it do? It prevents the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, wherein angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor. Right? So therefore, what does it do? It prevents vasoconstriction from occurring. So therefore, what would be the action? Again, it blocks the release of ACE from the lungs. Therefore, when ACE is not present, therefore, what would be the action? Since ACE is not, is not present, it can result into vasodilation. It can result into vasodilation. Take a look. What would be the report? Headache. Question, is headache a top priority? Question, guys, is headache a top priority or headache is expected or unexpected? Uh, let's, let's talk about the side effect of the drug. Since that is an antihypertensive, there is vasodilation. It's expected to develop orthostatic hypotension. Remember that. Okay. Next, what else is orthostatic hypotension? We also have cough, dry hacking cough. So it's expected why we block the release of ease from the lungs. So that's the main reason that coughing occurs. What else? Aside from coughing, we have also headache. Remember, what do you mean by side effect? Side effect means expected or unexpected. This is expected. Why is it, expe is it expected? Because of the vasodilation. Do you remember a patient with migraine? Do you remember in a patient with migraine when you take a lot of food rich in serotonin? Example, milk and cheese. Okay, right? So when you take a lot of food rich in serotonin or you are exposed to a bright light, whenever there is high level of serotonin, vasodilation occurs in migraine. And that vasodilation leads to a pulsating pain. So therefore, that vasodilation can also cause headache. So definitely, this is expected. Remember, headache in, the in taking lysinopril is expected. So I should eliminate number one. Okay, your question. Sir, when should I notify the HCP? When should I prioritize a patient taking uh, lysinopril? You will prioritize if the adverse effect is present. And what would be the adverse effect? Answer, if there is a rebound hypertension. Rebound. If the blood pressure is still high. So what does it mean? Rebound hypertension occur if the client is non-compliant. If the patient is non-compliant on taking the drug. 
right? So if the patient is non-compliant, then definitely rebound hypertension may occur. So what would be your health teaching? Health teaching, take the drug as prescribed religiously. So what do we mean by religiously? Aside from prayer and fasting, what else can you do? The word religiously means, okay, you should be able to take it, okay, always, daily, on time. Do not skip the drug or else rebound hypertension can occur. And what is the danger of rebound hypertension? Stroke may occur. Next, what else would be the adverse effect in the presence of angioedema? Angioedema is common on African and Asian descent. African Asian descent, which is anjo means blood vessel, edema means swelling. So there could be swelling of the blood vessel. So therefore, what would be the first sign of anjo edema that you will be reporting? Answer, lip or tongue swelling. Lip or tongue swelling. Or if the lip is swollen, the tongue is swollen, possibly the airways can be also swollen. That is why it's called an adverse effect. You need to notify the HEP. So this would be your adverse effect. And of course, if the cough becomes persistent. Remember, a dry hacking cough is expected but not persistent. Not to the point that the patient will not be able to rest. Not to the point that the patient may not be able to rest. So definitely, the headache is just expected. Next, let's talk about question number two. COPD patient on a tripod position. Oops, okay. Oxygen saturation is 92%. Oops, I'm going to put a question mark. Why? Because the auto, auto saturation is low. Remember, the normal oxygen saturation is 95 to 100%. Okay, let's talk about number three. Patient with chest pain on a scale of 5 over 10 after gardening. So what do we mean by this condition? Chest pain after an activity or during an exertion is a sign of an angina pectoris. Question, is angina pectoris emergency? No, because angina pectoris can be relieved by rest and nitroglycerin. It is relieved by rest and nitroglycerin. So remember, this is still stable. And this could be treated by rest and nitroglycerin. So I'm going to eliminate number three, this is not your answer. Let's talk about number four. Diabetes type 2 with an RBS of 390. What do you remember about the random blood sugar? Okay, the normal blood sugar is, answer, it should be according to Sonder 70 to 110 MG per DL. So since that is 390, that's very high. Why a diabetic patient should only have less than 200 MG per DL. Normally, in diabetic, that should only be less than 200. So 390 is very high. So definitely, I'm going to put a question mark with number four. Everybody, for those who are here in our Zoom classroom, which one is your top priority? Should it be your number two or number four? Please key in your answers. Number two or number four? Please key in your answers. Christine, Mar, France, Heidi, Ms. Jasper, Kay Renz, Liana, Norlinda, Jamie, and Mary Grace. What do you think would be the answer? All right, now you can now get the correct answer. I'm so happy for you. Correct answer should be number four. Why not number two? Because number two, that is expected in a client with COPD. Remember, when I talk about COPD, letter C means it's a chronic condition. Remember, it's a chronic condition and chronic is not a priority. Remember, normally a patient with COPD is breathing in a low level oxygen. They are breathing in a low level oxygen. So if there is COPD, what is the normal? Okay, the normal is they have less than 95% oxygen saturation, but not to the point of less than 90, but not to the point of less than 90. If it's less than 90, that's called respiratory failure. So I'm going to answer number four. Why? Because number four is an impending sign of DKA. This is an impending sign of DKA. Oh, sir, you're questioning. So it's a type two. The type two client also develops DKA. The answer, yes. Type 2 can also develop. Remember, DKA is very common in type 1. However, okay, it can also appear in type 2 patient if the patient is, okay, exposed to stress, pregnancy, surgery, okay, trauma or infection. You have to remember stressful situation can result in the DKA. Now, question, what would be the clinical picture of DKA? DKA is, okay, is uh, manifested or characterized by hyperglycemia, which is 300 to 600. What else? Aside from hyperglycemia, dehydration. Since there is hyperglycemia, osmotic diuresis will occur, leading to dehydration, and dehydration leads to hypotension. That's why it's a life-threatening condition, followed by metabolic acidosis. Why? In DKA, there is a breakdown of fat. 
there is a breakdown of fat. And that breakdown of fat leads to the accumulation of ketones. And ketones are considered okay acidic in nature. That is why there's metabolic acidosis. So remember, dehydration, hypotension plus acidosis, it can result into a diabetic coma. So that is why if you would be asked in the actual question, if you would be asked in the actual question, which one would be a priority on a care of a client with DK dancer is fluids because shock may occur. And after the fluids, that's the time that we could give an IV regular insulin. IV fluids followed by an IV regular insulin. So usually an insulin drip. You do not give insulin via bolus. Guys, that's critical. Remember, it should only be via IV drip. All right, so the correct answer should be number four. Oh, good job, guys. Okay, you can now okay answer prioritization question. Let's proceed now with your question number eight. Okay, question number eight. Can I ask Miss Christine? Miss Christine, kindly unmute your mic and read the question. Hello. Go ahead, Bob. Ma'am Christine, are you around? Hello? Okay, it seems that Miss Christine is not around. Okay, I'm, go I'm going to call you, okay, later. Let's have first Miss Heidi. Miss Heidi, do you have your microphones with you, please? Number eight. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, nurse is interviewing a client with aphasia due to a recent CVA stroke. What should the nurse do? All so right, about the fly. Okay, the main topic, thank you, Heidi. The main topic is all about aphasia. Okay, now what do we mean by aphasia? Ah, means absence. Aphasia means speech, so absence of speech. All right, so this is due to CVA or stroke, and this is one of the most common finding in stroke. Now, aphasia could be of different types. What are the types of aphasia? Number one, it could be either expressive. This is the most common. In expressive aphasia, this is what we call a motor speech affectation. So therefore, there is inability of the client to want to speak. Okay, motor speech is affected, so the client may not be able to express written and spoken language. They may not be able to express written, okay, and spoken language. Number two, some of them may have receptive aphasia. When we talk about receptive, that is a sensory speech affectation. So the patient has inability to understand. They can speak, but they cannot understand. That's what we call receptive. So remember, expressive affects your Broca's area, the motor speech, while receptive affects the Wernicke's area. Okay, next, let's talk about your number three. We have also the mixed, or sometimes it's called a global aphasia, when both okay, conditions are present. So when both conditions are present, we call it mixed and global aphasia. Now, you are asked about what should the nurse do. So definitely, should the nurse do positive? So we are talking about communication. So how do you communicate? Of course, it should be therapeutic. It should be standard, therapeutic, and standard. So you, you will be using select all that apply. Number one, use sign language. Sign language, standard or not standard? This is not standard. Why should you use sign language? Kapwa ko mahal ko, right? <laughs> you do not use sign language. When do we use sign language? Sign language should only be used when the patient has hearing loss. Do we have hearing loss in the statement? No. So definitely eliminate number one. Number two, speak in a normal tone of voice. Is it therapeutic? Yes. Is it standard? Yes. Number three, avoid touching the patient. Avoid touching or we could use touch as indicated. You could use touch as appropriate, right? Because using touch means what? Okay, it means when you use touch, it's therapeutic. You are providing through presence of a nurse, right? So definitely avoid, that's wrong, okay? You could use touch. But guys, be careful if the client's cultural background, okay, uh, it will, 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 will cause... Uh, will cause changes on our on our therapeutic uh therapeutic touch okay so caution if the client is say for example an islam or coming from a conservative background okay now let's talk about number 4 okay number 4 ask questions with a yes or no oops 
I'll put a question mark on this. Why? Because this is close-ended. And you have to remember that close-ended question is non-therapeutic. Oh, let's go back later on. <laughs> let's talk about number five. Okay, number five, give time for the patient to answer the question. Okay, so what do you think? Can you give time? Since they have, okay, they have difficulty on answering your question. So giving time and providing time is therapeutic. So definitely, we are sure that numbers two and five are therapeutic. How about number four? Yes, this is a close-ended question, but what is the condition of aphasia? What is aphasia? Absence of speech or difficulty in speaking? They have a slurring of speech. Now, will you provide them an open-ended question? Tell me how you feel. Or will that be appropriate at this time? Okay, will that be appropriate at this time? Will they be able to talk? Or will you wait for about eight hours before they would speak? No, of course. You need to be efficient. So definitely the use of closed-ended questions can also be appropriate. Not all closed-ended questions are incorrect. Remember that. Closed-ended questions can also be done when a patient has a patient, such as in a patient with severe stroke, or Alzheimer's disease. So definitely the correct answers are two, four, and five. Okay, two, four, and five are the correct answers. Okay, is everybody learning, guys? Can you see a thumbs up if everybody is learning from the topic that I have given? Yes, all right, moving forward. Let's talk about question number nine. Okay, question number nine. It's only until 15, don't you worry. Okay, can we have Miss Jamie? Miss Jamie, kindly read question number nine. Ms. Jamie, hello. Hello, Ms. Jamie, are you around? All right. Do you have a, a good internet connection or is your microphone working? If not, then I'll call you later on, okay? Let's have Ms. Charlene first. Ms. Charlene Celestre, can you please unmute your microphone to read the question number nine? And there's... Mom, you are on mute. I'm sorry. Mom Charlene, you're on mute. Kindly unmute po. A nurse is caring for an intubated patient. What should the nurse do? Okay, thank you, Mom Charlene. Topic. The topic is all about intubated patient. So you know for a fact that who is the patient that is intubated? Okay, what's the purpose of intubation? Purpose to maintain a patent airway. Okay. What would be the purpose? The purpose is to maintain a patent airway. Okay, this is usually okay, being done for a patient with a crisis or an emergency situation. So for emergency situation, this one can be used. And what are the types of intubation? Types of intubation, it could be through a short-term use, endotracheal intubation. Okay. What else? Aside from endotracheal, wherein the tubes will be inserted through the mouth or through the nose, guided by okay, a scope, followed by number two, we have the tracheostomy, which can be used as a permanent okay, airway management or a long-term airway management. Okay. Now, you're asked, what should the nurse do? Illness management. How do you manage? That's positive. So which one is standard? Which one is safe? Right? Okay, standard, which one is safe? Which one is appropriate? Okay, let's see. Number one, maintain the head of bed elevation at 30 degrees. What do you mean by 30 degrees? 30 degrees is a semi-fowler's position. Is semi-fowler's position maintaining a patent airway? Yes or no? The answer, yes. Will that promote expansion of the lungs? Yes or no? The answer, yes. So definitely number one could be a good option. Okay, next. Let's talk about number two. Suction the endotracheal tube early. Safe or unsafe? Of course, this one would be unsafe. Number, okay, number two, this one would be unsafe. So definitely, I'm going to eliminate number two. What makes it unsafe? The word early. Okay, what makes it unsafe? Because of the word early. Okay, so definitely you should not, okay, suction the client early. What would be the problem? The problem here is, okay, tracheal tissue damage. It can cause tracheal tissue damage. What else aside from tracheal tissue damage? It can also result into a life-threatening heart block. It can also result into a life-threatening heart block. So that's the major concern. So that is why suctioning should only be done as PRN. Okay, next. Let's talk about number three. Monitor the respiratory status BID. Or what do you mean by the word BID? BID means twice a day. 
So when we talk about twice a day, Q12. Okay, is Q12 sufficient for the monitoring of the respiratory status? Question, who are intubated clients? Intubated clients are those who are critically ill, right? So if they are critically ill, what should be the monitoring? Should it be more frequent or less frequent? It should be more frequent. So definitely that's eliminated. So according to your references, okay, if you will be reading your textbook, the respiratory status monitoring should be every two to three hours. It should be done every two to three hours. So definitely we eliminate number three four reposition the patient q shift hmm. is it q shift the repositioning should not be q shift and what would be the positioning it should be every two hours if the client is awake okay generally guys when we talk about repositioning to prevent okay lung collapse to prevent pneumonia to, pre to prevent pressure ulcer then it should be done every two hours for as long as the client is awake remember there are now changes on the evidence-based practice according to research we can only reposition the client when they are awake so what would happen if they are sleeping you just provoke promote them Okay, promote or give time for them to sleep because a disruptive sleeping pattern can decrease their WBC responses. So therefore, they would be further at risk to skin breakdown. So again, repositioning should be done during daytime or when the client is awake. So the, the correct answer, it should be number one. Okay, let's proceed now with question number 10. Okay, moving forward, you can get now the correct answer. Number 10, can we have somebody to read this for me? Okay, can we ask again? Let's have uh, mm -hmm. Mar. Mar, can you please read question number 10? Hello, Mar. A 53-year-old okay, client has been diagnosed with liver cirrhosis which is a correct understanding regarding his dietary regimen. Okay, thank you for reading more. Topic, the patient has liver cirrhosis. Okay, this is the end process. This is the end, okay, or what you call the terminal condition or the last stage of liver damage. Okay, do you remember the first stage? It will become fatty liver. From fatty liver, okay, it will be uh, it will be degenerating that can result into liver cirrhosis. So therefore, this is what we call the end stage liver damage. Okay, now when we talk about end stage liver damage, you are asked about what would be the diet. What would be the diet for a client? Okay, now let's talk about number one. Avoid the intake of food high in protein. So what do you mean by number one? Number one states it's a low protein. Number one states it's a low protein. Could this be good? Uh, let's put a question mark. Because according to some of your references, your books, they may say that it should be low protein. Why? Because the end product of protein break breakdown is ammonia. The end product of protein breakdown is ammonia, and ammonia can result into hepatic encephalopathy. That's according to your books. If you are reading your, okay, Bruners and Sudarts, Blacks and Hooks, do you remember those? Lewis, then definitely, okay, those are the suggestions, okay? So definitely, that could be a good answer. How about number two? Over a high-carbohydrate diet, of course. Okay, so I'll be putting a question mark in number two. Why? Because the client with liver cirrhosis, since liver is involved in carbohydrate metabolism, since liver is involved in carbohydrate metabolism, then therefore, if there is cirrhosis of the liver, carbohydrate metabolism is impaired, then hypoglycemia would be the result. So definitely, a high-carbohydrate diet can also be helpful. Okay, I'm putting question mark with one and two. Next, number three, limit the intake of potassium-rich food. Okay, question. Can the client limit the potassium or should they increase the potassium in the diet? Okay, what do you remember about liver cirrhosis? In liver cirrhosis, okay, there would be, okay, the, the decreased ability of the liver to eliminate excessive hormones. Okay, I repeat, there is inability of the liver to eliminate excessive hormones. What are those excessive hormones? Example, aldosterone. So what would be the problem in liver cirrhosis? They have increased aldosterone. And remember, aldosterone is a primary mineral of corticoid. And what will happen? It will promote sodium retention. So when it promotes sodium retention, sodium goes in. What will happen to the potassium? The potassium will go out. 
Remember that when sodium goes in, potassium will go out. So should you limit potassium or should you increase potassium? Answer, you should increase, right? Well, okay, if you should increase, not to limit, since the client with liver cirrhosis is suffering from hypokalemia. Okay, next, let's talk about number four. Increase the intake of sodium to prevent asterixis. Remember, they have sodium retention. Guys, kulang pa ba yung sodium niya? Dagdagan mo pa lalo. Para lalo siyang mag-congest, magka-edema, magka, edema, magka <laughs> Lalo siyang mahirapan, right? So definitely, you will not increase the sodium, but rather limit the sodium and increase potassium in the diet. So therefore, we are left with options one and two, which are both correct, right? But definitely, we have to answer the evidence-based practice. Everybody, key in your answers. What should be the best answer? Should it be number one or number two? Everybody who have attended my pre lecture, should it be number one or number two? Okay, key in your answers, guys. One or two would be the best answer. Okay, there's okay, there's no judgment here. Just have your answers with you so that I could correct you later on. If your answers are wrong, we will correct it, right? If your answers are correct, I'm going to congratulate you. Okay. So let's see. Oh, each of you have different answers. Majority of answer would be number one, but the best answer it should be number two. Over oh, a high carbohydrate diet. Let's talk about the the the, the most common. Okay, most uh, the, the recent rather the recent finding in our research. Guys, please take time to keep yourself abreast with okay the the the, the journals. Okay, there's in journals and research findings. Now, according to research before, that protein intake can cause ammonia buildup that can contribute to hepatic encephalopathy. But they are telling us that high protein intake can promote what? Can promote organ maintenance. It can promote organ tissue repair, organ maintenance. So that is why, okay, according to studies, you need to increase intake of high biologic protein. So then the, the studies nowadays is to, in, to have an intake of a high biologic protein. So definitely, okay, the correct answer, it should be number two. All right. Are you learning, guys? For the recent test questions, can you give me a thumbs up if everything is clear? On our discussion, guys, remember evidence-based practice is also integrated in the actual test. So if you have graduated long time ago, right, you need to, again, be refreshed. And in Top Rank Review Academy, okay, whether you are a new graduate or graduate previously, then definitely we welcome all of you so that learning opportunities can be met. Okay, let's talk about your number 11. Number 11, can I ask again? Can I ask Miss Liana? Miss Liana, number 11, kindly. Who among the following has the highest risk for endometrial cancer? All right, topic. The topic is all about endometrial cancer, and the keyword is the highest risk. So, therefore, you're asked about the risk factor. Okay, now what do you remember about the cancer of the endometrium of a woman? Okay, the risk factor is high level of estrogen. Remember that. Remember, estrogen has a protective mechanism, but when you are exposed to excessive estrogen, that can result into what? Into endometrial cancer. That is why when women are giving birth, when women are giving birth, their lifespan increases because the hormone of the pregnancy is progesterone. So definitely as a woman, okay, you need okay, to give birth. Why? To increase the progesterone or else the estrogen can rise. So that is why who has the highest risk? Of course, those who have high level of estrogen. Those who have high level of estrogen. Okay, please take note. Number one, late menopausal. So if they have late menopausal period, are they exposed to high level of estrogen? Yes or no? The answer, yes. Early menarche, late menopause is the risk factor. I repeat, you have to indicate number one, late menopause because they are exposed to high level of estrogen. Early menarche is a risk factor for endometrial cancer. So I'm going to include number one. How about number two? Use of IUD. It should be IUD, guys. Use of IUD for contraception. Intrauterine device. Is IUD containing estrogen? The answer, no. IUD is not containing, but rather it's a copper wire. It's a metal. So definitely, aside from, uh, okay, aside from late menopause and early menarche, please also include the use of what contraceptive? Answer, pills. 
oral contraceptive pills because that may contain estrogen. Next, let's talk about number three. Has given birth at the age of 18. High risk or low risk? This is a low risk. Who are at risk? Of course, those who has given birth at 35 years. At 35 because definitely 35 means to say that exposure. Okay, exposure to estrogen. Next, number four. History of five spontaneous vaginal birth? The answer, no. Why? Because they have five multiparous who are at risk. Those who have not given birth, nulliparity. It should be nulliparity. Please also add, this is most common among obese individual, okay, obesity, and of course, women whose diet is high in fat. Diet high in fat. Why? Because the food of cancer cells would be fat. Okay? So, therefore, those are just some of the manifestations. Please also add that only contraceptive pills, but those who have used hormonal replacement therapy. Hormonal replacement therapy that may contain estrogen. So, the best answer, it should be number one, late age for menopause. All right. Are we clear to the risk factor? Now, question. What would be the early indication, warning signs that there is an endometrial cancer? Answer, bleeding and between menses. If there is bleeding in between menses, what else? Heavy bleeding. If you are experiencing heavy bleeding in between your menstruation, what else? Aside from that, if there would be bleeding after an intercourse, uh, bleeding after in an intercourse, that is also an indication of endometrial cancer. So those are the warning signs. All right, let's proceed now. Let's talk about question number 12. Okay, question number 12. Okay, can we ask Miss Jasper? Miss Jasper, can you read number 12? Okay, a client underwent colonoscopy with polypectomy. Which statement by the client requires follow up? All right, thank you. The main topic is all about colonoscopy with polypectomy. So scopy means there is a direct visualization. Okay, so this is a cancer screening. Actually, the colonoscopy is cancer screening. It's also therapeutic in nature. So it could be diagnostic, so direct visualization of the colon, diagnostic to detect for cancers or tumor, or therapeutic because there is polypectomy. Okay, so direct visualization of colon and removal of polyps. Where polyps in the colon. All right, so therefore, you're asked about which one would you follow up. Follow up means it's negative. So you will be following up if the client has an unexpected response to therapy. If the patient has unexpected or worsening or a complication. So you are looking for something that is a worsening condition and a complication. So number one, blood tinge, bowel after 12 hours is expected. What do you think? This is true or false? The answer this is... This is true. This is expected, right? So a blunt inch bowel is expected. Will you follow up this one? The answer is no. Okay, next, number two. I feel full like I have an overloaded meal. Of course, I'm going to put a question mark. Feeling full after the procedure is a sign of a distension. And what do you remember about an abdominal distension? In local boards, we call it hard rigid abdomen in local boards. But in NCLEX, it will not appear as hard rigid abdomen. Usually, distension or increased abdominal girth. That is an indication of what condition. Answer, if you have the following manifestation, please place a red flag on it. Why? Because this could be a sign of peritonitis. Because this could be a sign of peritonitis. All right. So therefore, I'm going to put a question mark in number two, three. I will have someone to drive me home. What do you think? Safe. Is it expected and safe and true? The answer, yes, that's true. That is also, okay, safe. So you don't need to follow up. Why? Because post-colonoscopy, the client has still, okay, the effect of the sedative or the anesthesia. So if the client has the effect of sedative and anesthesia, having someone to drive them home would be good. Okay, next, let's talk about number four. I will eat a baked potato for dinner. What do you think? This is standard or not standard? This is also standard. So if it's standard, will you need to follow up? The answer, no. Why? Okay, because baked potato is considered as mechanical and soft. Mechanical soft that, okay, the stomach 
can tolerate. Not the peristalsis of the stomach, okay, can also tolerate. So the best answer, it should be number two. This is an emergency. Why is it an emergency? There is a sign of peritonitis. Why there is peritonitis? Number two is a sign of perforation. Because number two is a sign of perforation. All right. So now you can you can okay answer your prioritization questions with ease and deftness. Okay. Let's move forward with the last three questions. Okay. Question number thirteen. Okay. Let's have Miss K. Renz. Miss K. Renz, can you please read number thirteen? Acute pancreatitis is the finding to the newly admitted patient. The nurse understands that the patient. All right, topic, acute pancreatitis. Okay, you are asked about what would be the understanding of the nurse. Okay, first, acute pancreatitis is the inflammation of the pancreas. Now, what is the main reason why the pancreas is inflamed? Do you remember the life story of Rico Yan? Okay, those who are belonging to my batch, right? <laughs> Okay, so example, Ma'am Norlinda, yeah. Ma'am Jasper, do you remember? The cause of death of Rikian is acute pancreatitis in which the cause is the excessive intake of alcohol, right? So during the time, Rikian had a breakup with Claudine Barreto, right? Do you remember that? And what happens is Rikian had an intake of lots of alcohol. Now, alcohol leads to development of, okay, it leads to the development of a mucus plant. And that mucus plug leads to the obstruction in the flow of the pancreatic juice. It leads to the obstruction of the flow of the pancreatic juice. So when that plug is present, the flow of pancreatic juice is impaired. So there would be backflow of the pancreatic juice. So therefore, what would be the hallmark? What would be the hallmark? The hallmark is autodigestion. And what would be the cause of death in pancreatitis? Autodigestion can result into hemorrhage. So watch out for hemorrhage. Oh, what are the signs and symptoms of hemorrhage in acute pancreatitis? Answer, signs and symptoms. Watch out for a colon sign, which is a discoloration, bluish discoloration of the umbilical, umbil umbilicus region. You need also to watch out for a great burner sign. What do we mean by a great burner sign? That is the discoloration of the flank area. And this discoloration is a sign of hemorrhage. Okay, you have to remember that one. It is a sign of hemorrhage. So therefore, that is an emergency. So you are asked about what is your understanding about pancreatitis positive? Which one is true? Which one is standard? Which one is safe for a patient with pancreatitis? Uh, number one, acute pancreatitis should take oral pain meds. Oral or parenteral? <laughs> it should be parenteral. You do not give oral medication. Remember, patients should be on NPO. This is acute. Initially, the patient is on NPO and IV fluid should be instituted. Why? Because if the client will take food or medications through the mouth, that can promote what? That can promote the further release of pancreatic juice. And that further release of pancreatic juice can result in the further autodigestion. So definitely, taking oral pain medication or food orally, safe or unsafe. This is unsafe. Okay, next, number two. Blood sugar will be tested orally. I know for a fact that blood sugar will be tested. Why? The blood sugar should be tested because the pancreas has also an endocrine function. So therefore, in pancreatitis or autodigestion, it will also damage the beta cells in the islet of longer hands. So when the beta cells in the islet of longer hands has been damaged, what can happen? Destruction of beta cells leads to lack of insulin. So when the insulin is deficient, what would be the result? The result is hyper. Glycemia. What would be the result? The result is hyperglycemia. So definitely, should we test the blood sugar? Of course. My question is, should it be early? So that's why I put a question mark in number two. Okay, next. Let's talk about number three. Take a lot of magnesium hydroxide. Of course, this can also be true. This can also be true. Why? Because in a patient with pancreatitis, what would be the problem? This is an acute biologic crisis. What do you remember about acute biologic crisis? This is a stressful condition. And stress can result to a high level of hydrochloric acid. So when the hydrochloric acid is high, what would be the result? What would be the result? The result is peptic ulcer. So definitely, magnesium hydroxide should be taken. My only question, should it be a lot? Should be, it be a lot? Oh, another reason. Another reason why they should take magnesium hydroxide is because of the area of fat necrosis. 
Autodigestion leads to fat necrosis. Whenever there is fat necrosis, calcium and magnesium, calcium and magnesium will attach to an area of fat necrosis that can result into hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia. I repeat, why they should take magnesium hydroxide? Number one, because of the risk of stress ulcer. Number two, it's because of the area of fat necrosis leading to hypomagnesemia. All right, let's talk about number four. They should have a clear liquid diet for 48 hours. What, what, that's, that, that's, I, what, what did I mention a while ago? I have mentioned about NPO. They should not take anything. It should only be IV fluids, NPO. Why? Because of the risk of release of pancreatic juice that can lead to further autodigestion. So we are left between number two and number three. All right, guys, what would be the correct answer? I'm waiting for your chats. What should be the correct answer? Should it be number two or number three? Should it be number two or number three? Please place your, okay, your answers. All right, don't be shy. For those who are in YouTube Live or Facebook Live, then I also encourage you to participate. All right, so you have your answers already. Let's see the correct answer. It should be number, number three. Remember, a lot of magnesium hydroxide because for two purposes. Do you remember the two purposes? Number one, in the prevention of stress ulcers. Number two, it will also help to treat the hypomagnesemia. Now, number two is also correct. However, it should not be done early. <laughs> Uh, usually, it should only be done, okay, in a matter of time, okay? It should not be early because that is frequent in nature, okay? So, it should be done, okay? Say, for example, the doctor's order, it can be done every two hours and then every four hours and then okay, it can be done before meals, right? So, definitely, number three would be the best answer. Next, let's talk about question number 14. Guys, are you learning? Can I see a thumbs up from everybody? Learning from the discussion. All right. Okay, let's talk about now question number 14. Number 14, Mom Norlinda. Mom Norlinda, are you around? Kindly answer number 14. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, what to include in the testing plan for an older adult with urinary incontinence? Select all that apply. Okay, thank you, Mom Norlinda. All right, so the main topic, Mom Norlinda, is all about urinary incontinence. Uh, what do you mean by incontinence? Okay, incontinence means that there is involuntary, involuntary passage of urine, involuntary passage of urine. Okay, risk factors who are at risk for this condition. Answer number one, older women. Usually, older women with okay, a problem with their bladder integrity, such as those who are multiparous. Multiparous women, that's very common for them. Who else are at risk? Okay, who else are at risk? Risk factor may also include, aside from aging and being a woman, okay, another risk factor is the, okay, the presence of a secondary condition. Example, UTI, urinary tract infection. What else can be observed in men? BPH, okay. What else aside from BPH for those with Alzheimer's disease, right? Or it could be because of your surgical procedure, okay? Procedures, okay? Procedures, say for example, okay, damage caused by cystoscopy or other surgical procedures. All right. Now you are asked about include in the teaching plan. So what do you include? Include means positive. So you are asked which one is good and standard, which one is safe, which one is appropriate. All right, let's have your select all that apply, check or X. If it's appropriate, let's put a check. If it's inappropriate, let's put, put an X. Number one, avoid consuming caffeinated drinks. Avoid caffeine. Is caffeine considered as a bladder irritant? Yes or no? The answer, yes. So when you avoid it, is it standard or not standard? This is standard. Remember, caffeine, carbonated beverages should be avoided. All of the bladder irritants, including alcohol, should be avoided. Okay, number two. Have a scheduled time for urination. What do you mean by a scheduled time? Normally, okay, we have to provide a scheduled time every, okay, normally every two to three hours. According to Bruners, every two to three hours. If you will be reading Ignata Vicious every three hours. So that's also the same. That's also true. So every two to three hours, scheduled time, that's what we call bladder retraining program. What do you call that? Okay, that procedure, that's called a bladder retraining program. Can that maintain the integrity of the bladder muscle? Yes or no? The answer, yes. So this is good. Number three, limit the fluids 1,000 ml per day. When do we limit the fluid? We will only 
limit the fluid if there would be congestion or else the patient will suffer from hypovolemia and dehydration. So this is not standard. That should be eliminated. Number four, take your prescribed diuretic in the morning. Is diuretic taken in the morning? Since that is prescribed, that is good. When it is morning, that is also good. To prevent urination in the evening, that can be at risk for injury. And of course, disrupted slipping pattern would be the result. So definitely number four is a good option. Next, number five, older adults are expected to have a decreased bladder control. Decreased bladder control, is it expected among elderly Expected or unexpected, that is unexpected because if it's for older adults, that could be a sign of UTI, BPH, Alzheimer's disease. And that is an indication of a secondary problem. So that is why the best answers are one, two, and four. Okay. So that's how to answer select all the applied questions. Again, nothing beats knowing the correct answer. All right. So the correct answers are one, two, and four. All right. Let's proceed now to the last okay topic. Okay, let's have your question number 15. I hope that everybody is learning and you are still with me. Can I see us? All right, good job. Okay, let's have question number 15. Okay, last. Okay, can I ask somebody to read this for me? Miss Charlene. Miss Charlene, kindly read number 15. Hello, Mom Charlene. Hi. Uh... What should the nurse include in the teaching plan of a client with COPD? All right. Thank you, Ma'am Charlene. Topic is all about COPD. Okay. So the keyword is COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And the most common types of COPD are your emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Emphysema, pink puffer. Chronic bronchitis, blue bloater. So what is the major concern? The major concern in a patient with COPD is, answer, they have a decreased oxygen saturation. They are breathing in a low level of oxygen. So now, what's your keyword? The keyword, guys, is you would include in the health pitch thing, positive. So definitely you are asked about which one is good, which one is standard, which one is safe for the patient, right? Okay, let's talk about number one. Provide high calorie and high protein meal. Do you remember a decreased oxygen saturation? What's happening if the patient has decreased oxygen saturation? Hypoxia, fatigue. So if the patient has fatigue, is the patient, okay, developing increased appetite or decreased appetite? Answer, because of hypoxia, they have decreased appetite. So if they have decreased appetite, it can result into weight gain or weight loss. Definitely, it can result into weight loss. So if there is weight loss, so you provide high calorie and high protein meals, standard or not standard? This is standard for the client. Now, number two, place the client's head of bed 90 degrees. What do you mean by 90 degrees? High powers. Is high powers position good for the long stick span? Of course, yes. So this could also be a right answer. So I'm going to place question mark for both numbers one and two. These are probable answers. Number three, include cabbage and cauliflower in the diet. What you remember about cabbage and cauliflower if you're in the philippines cabbage and cauliflower is common product of baguio city and tagaytay city right wherein these are called highland vegetable what do you remember about highland vegetables highland vegetables are gas forming they are gas forming so remember is gas forming food appropriate for a client with a loss of appetite the answer no because if it's gas forming, then definitely further loss of appetite will be its result. So I'm going to eliminate number three. At the same time, cabbage and cauliflower are not good sources of protein. Okay, so that's why it's not the answer. Next, number four, consume polyunsaturated fatty acid. Of course, this is also good. Polyunsaturated as to compared with the saturated and the trans fat. These are what we call the healthy fats. What are the healthy fats? Examples of healthy fats are your fish oils, right? What else aside from fish oils? Another thing, avocado oil. Avocados, that, that's also called a healthy fat. What else? Almonds, okay, is also included in the healthy fats. Soy, okay, soy beverages or tofu, right? Or tofu, that could be also, okay, uh, 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 it, that, that would also be, uh, com uh, composed of omega-3, omega-6, and linoleic fatty acid, which is also considered as a healthy fat. So definitely, if it's healthy, it should not be included, yes. But again, number four should be emphasized. Is it on COPD or coronary artery disease? 
What will be the answer? Is it related to COPD? No. That should be related to coronary artery disease, those with hyperlipidemia, cardiovascular conditions. Okay. So definitely that is common for atherosclerotic condition. So I'm going to eliminate number four. That's unrelated for COPD. So you are left with two options again. Okay. It's either number one or number two. Everybody key in your answers. What should be the answer one or two? Everybody, please, okay, key in your answer. Should it be option number one or option number two? All right, okay. So you have now your answers. Oh, all right, so let's answer the correct answer. Final answer, it should be number one. Please, high caloric and high protein meals. But remember, it should be a small frequent meal. Uh, guys, why number two is, okay, is uh, not appropriate? Uh, should it be high powders or orthopnic? <laughs> what does the book says? What does Saunders and Cochier says? You have there. The image is shown in the book if you are reading the book. They are encouraging clients to be an orthopnic or a tripod position. Orthopnic or tripod position, they are encouraged to lean forward because that can increase, okay, their pulmonary ventilation and they, it will decrease their respiratory effort. So that makes number one as the best answer. All right. So we're done with the first 15 items, guys. Thank you so much. Don't leave yet. Okay. I'd like to thank everybody for choosing and, okay, staying with me in Top Rank Review Academy. Again, our cycle, okay, our cycle 19, okay, will be starting soon on October, sorry, October 13, October 13. And the final coaching will commence on November 3. All right. So I am inviting everybody, okay, to join us in our comprehensive and final coaching classes or weekend classes in Top Rank Review Academy. Please don't forget to screenshot our, okay, like us on the Facebook page and follow us in our Instagram account and uh, add us in our account so that okay, your inquiries can be answered, okay? You can also PM us directly, Jeremy Rod Cabanas at your service. Then I will also okay, help you achieve your dream of becoming a U.S. registered nurse, a UKRN, or an RN in the Middle East. So once again, guys, I am Jeremy Cabanas at your service, okay? Thank you so much for choosing Top Rank Review Academy. Don't leave yet because we will have somebody to present first because uh, if your concerns are all about the processing of your documents, right? It's very difficult if you will be uh, having a DIY on the processing of your documents. So therefore, we will be having the time, okay, to play a video about the processing of your documents so that you will be, be just focusing on the review process. Okay, so I encourage everybody, okay, to, to watch a video, okay, here's her mon of quick processing solution to provide yes. us the orientation. Thank you so much, guys. Hello, good afternoon, Sir Jeremy. So, hello, good day, nurses. My name is Mon, Senior Processing Officer of Quick Processing Solutions. We prepared a short video presentation for everyone who is struggling processing their international application. Hope this video presentation helps you to consider your quick to, to, to consider quick processing solutions to be part of your dream. Okay, so JR, please. Sergey Paplinapo. Thank you very much. Before we start, I have a question. Do you know how to apply and process your documents? Yes or no? That is why we are here to help you understand to process your international exam application. I will discuss a quick background regarding our company. We envision to be a world-class consultancy for credentialing and processing among medical professionals across various disciplines. We commit to provide a reliable and consistent yet affordable solutions for all credentialing and processing concerns of medical professionals across various disciplines. In QPS, we have our core values, quality, reliability, affordability, results. Quality, we make sure our services are standard. Reliability, 
you can trust us to process your documents and all the information that we're giving you are accurate. Affordability. We make sure that the prices are the cheapest among our competitors. Results. We make sure that your eligibility is ready and you can take your exam as soon as you are ready. In QPS, you will experience a quick and hassle-free online examination application process. We offer NCLEX RN, exam application, license renewal, license endorsement, license reactivation, score transfer, and visa screen. For UKCBT, we offer NMC registration, PRC license verification, and UKCBT scheduling. For Middle East International application, we offer DOHAD for Abu Dhabi, Dataflow, Haad, Prometric Dataflow, DHA for UAE, SCFHS for Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, QCHP for Qatar. We believe in the value of result. Here are some of our nurses who trusted QPS to process their application. Please give time to read their testimonials so you can be inspired. What are you waiting for? I hope you got inspired reading the testimonials of our NCLEX and UKCBT passers. Experience a quick and hassle-free online application at an affordable price. You can book your free consultation. We will discuss eligibility profiling, requirements, process flow and timeline, and the cost of service. You can see the difference of QPS with regards to international application prices. 
In QPS, we give the best deals for you. Here's the schedule of our processing mentors. Please don't forget to like our fan page, Quick Processing Solutions, our Facebook account, QPS Quick Processing, our Instagram, Quick Processing Solutions PH. If you want to reserve your slot and decided to process your international application to QPS, we provide our mode of payment. Reservation fee is deductible to the grand total of the package. Let's start your dream to become your reality. Here at QPS, we believe affordable and reliably quick. Thank you and God bless us all. So nurses, if you have questions with regards of your international application, please PM us on our Facebook page. So I provided the link of our Facebook page para if in case if you have question, masasagot namin kagad sa inyo. Okay? So yan. So PM ko. Thank you very much, Sir JR. Thank you so much, Sir Rafael. And thank you so much, Sir Jeremy. Thank you so much, guys, for attending to our free lecture series. And we hope, guys, na marami po kayong natutunan po sa amin. Thank you so much and see you all our next session for the free series.